So you wanted to know a little bit about the, the website and the course in the website. Oh. <laughs> Excuse me, like whenever you assign homework, will it be under the tab that says assignments? Because I feel on there and it says like February 13th or something, it has the 50 names for comp the 50 ways to name your compound. Yeah, that's extra credit. And that's the only thing that I see on there. I was just wanting uh, to make sure that, I, yeah, am I missing the, the homework may not show up under assignments. Okay. It might be considered a like a quiz. Let me let me open up the uh, I'll open up the website. <clears throat> have you um, have you registered with St. Gage yet? Um, we need to do. How long does St. Gage go for? Because I bought it last semester. It depends. If you buy one semester, it's expired. If you buy a year, then you'll still be good. I'm sorry, I knew at the majority of this. So, uh, and I, I put two, I think I put two options in the bookstore. Let me go to the bookstore. Is it showing? Yeah. Let's go to the bookstore and current students. There's the bookstore. We'll call up um, no courses there. Oh, that would be. There we go. There's a, uh, there's, I think that two one hundred. So. They should have the same books though for the new award. Okay. So, uh, I don't think they play them. Else they work. So there's San Gage Unlimited for one semester. Yeah. Since this course only lasts one semester, the I had the bookstore only list the one semester version. It's one hundred and fifty six dollars. The uh, if you look in the let's see in the uh, syllabus, let me see what it says. Yeah, in the syllabus you can buy for a year two hundred and thirty dollars. That's this semester. I don't know what it was when you bought it. Um, well, I'm sure I still have an account with St. Gage um, because I had it on, I had to purchase it on like my math. Uh -huh. um, so I was able to log in. Okay. So, um, but when you, when you register for this course, okay, I got to change my password. Uh, when you register for this course, let's go into Brightspace here. And then call up the course. Uh, what number here it is. And instead of going to assignments, I'd go to content. Click on content across the main bar. Well, there it goes. And then look down the left hand side and look for well, let me do it as a student. So it'll look like what you're gonna see. Okay. Here it goes. This one where it says engage. Click on that one. Then go over here and look where it says under Cengage homework registration. It says Chem 100 introduction in chemistry and so forth. You click on that one. 
that's where you need to go to register. Okay. And it'll open up the page and click here to open your content. And if you already have an account with them, this is where you put in your um, the email that you bought the product under. Okay. It should be your new river account. If you bought it under a different one, then there might be problems with the registration. Because all my students are recognized under uh, in Brightspace and they're linked with Cengage based upon their new river email account. So if that's a problem, then I'll have to show you how to how to get help with that. But once you go in here, once you uh, sign in and register, if, if you're already in, then you'll sign in once, and that'll be up. that'll be it. That's all you have to do one time. And after that, when you go back to the course, I'm, I'm showing this on the board too. Oh. <laughs> If you go to the course, then each time you get to a new module, each module represents an exam. Okay. So that first module, and you go in here, and there should be a link. Uh, let's collapse it so it won't be so busy. Collapse on. Um, here it is homework. You click on that, you go straight to the homework assignment for each of the chapters. Okay. The uh, well, you've already printed this off, so you know where that that's that's a table with charges. That's not the one that tells you which one to learn. Actually, um, the symbols and the um, naming compounds, extra credits. They're in the second module, but I thought I'd better give the class a, a heads up so that if if you're kind of pressed for time or you, you don't memorize fast, then they'll give you more time to memorize those symbols, the ones that I marked off. Okay. Okay, so if you're having trouble registration, then go to, um, let's see. Go back up to same page homework registration. Look at just below where we clicked on uh, homework registration and go down here, same page office hours for troubleshooting. So up until February 17th, the same page um, tech support has opened office hours on these days, Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 12 noon to 2 p.m., Tuesday, Thursday from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. If you click on that link right there, mm -hmm. then uh, that will take you to a, a, a video session. Okay. And then um, if you do it on the computer that you normally use, because they may want to uh, uh, take hold of your computer and do some things for you. Okay. I forget what they call it. It's a fancy word. <laughs> yeah. uh, and if that doesn't work, then I've got uh, Dee Frederick's contact information. She's a, the account representative for us. And you can call her or you can email her and uh, set up a meeting with her. Okay. And, and uh, if she can't get it fixed, then it can't be fixed. <laughs> Put it that way. Okay. I've never had her uh, fail in, in fixing a problem. Thank you so much. <clears throat> All right. So today, what we're going to do is review. Get on camera. We're going to review uh, chapter one, two, and three that will be covered on exam one. And I'm working from the review document, uh, the one I just handed you out, and the one that's available in Brightspace. I'll show you what it looks like in just a second. Um, but before I go, since there's only one live body here and there's nobody on Zoom, uh, have you had a chance to look at, let's see, you're April? Yes. You've had a chance to look at the review document and try some of the problems? Uh, no. Okay. 
You need to do that before the exam, okay. which will be uh, Thursday. Yeah, okay. If you're going to take it, if you're going to take the exam um, face to face, it'll be on Thursday. If you're going to take it in bright space, you've got till midnight to be on time on Thursday. But if you think you're not ready for it, then postpone it. it it'll not shut down. Okay. You still have access to it. Okay. It'll just tell me that you're late. It won't try to lock you out. Okay. And um, all the exams are, if you take them in Brightspace, all the exams are proctored by Respondus Monitor and Lockdown Browser. Uh, are you familiar with those products? Yes. Okay. All right. So let me call up the uh, review document key, and we'll work from there. Let's see. Real down to my. Yeah, apparently I did purchase a year of skin gauge. Okay. Because it let me in on my phone. Uh huh. Into the intro. Okay, good. That's excellent. If you if you've taken two or more courses in skin gauge each semester, I think it's a pretty good deal. Yeah, I had. Um, this is my first semester. I'm going to take in two classes. I usually, had four. Uh -huh. So I, that's probably why they had purchased because they do it. The other ones mainly do it through Zen Gauge. Uh -huh. There's a move by some of our faculty to go uh, what they call OER, Open Educational Resources, and uh, that way. It doesn't cost the students anything except for registering them to the course. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but it's it's massive amount of work on the faculty's part to get that up and running. Wow. With the Sengage gauge way it is now, this is a ready-made product, and all I have to do is get you in there and it administers the homework, grades it for me, and I get the grades in in the uh, bright space grade book. Yeah, it makes it a lot easier. Otherwise, I probably would, would just throw homework out. I wouldn't do homework. Yeah. It's too time consuming That's for you and for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but hopefully, it'll help you with understanding the concepts that are in each of the chapters. Uh, okay, so let me get my remote going here. Cursor up there. This is still working. Yeah. Okay, so I've got some of these uh, in the review document highlighted. And uh, I picked out these because most of them, occasionally there's some repetition, but there, there are nuances that I'm looking for. If it looks repetitive, there's something slightly different about the next one that wasn't covered in the one that looks like it in the previous question. Uh, so let's see, we've got, I gotta wear my watch on my belt because of the the buckle class broke. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've ordered another one, but it's not going to be here for a few days. Oh. Off and running, I guess. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, so number one. And by the way, this for this review document, I'll give you a copy of it. There's a uh, the key for it that will look like this without the highlight part is also in Brightspace. 
I don't print it out because I used to do that and I broke the printer. Because it was just too many pages too fast and I overheated it. So I just hand out the, uh, the one with no answers in it. And I also give you the uh, handwritten worked problems. That's what that is. And they're, they're, uh, each of the numbers match. And if you, if you look at the, if you use the review document <clears throat> as if it were an exam, a test, and it's laid out that way, then you can go through and then you can go grade it with the key and see which ones you got wrong. And you can focus your energies on the weak spots. And if you still can't figure out how, how you missed it or how to do it, that's what the worked problems is for. The handwritten um, sheet will work out every problem in the review document and show you how at least one way to do the problem. There's usually two or more ways to fit it to. Uh, work a problem. And if you have a, a more comfortable way, that's fine. But uh, that's one way to work them in that uh, handwritten product. Okay, so number one, the number of milligrams in 6.6 .6 kilograms. 6.6 .6 kilograms. This is a unit conversion. Uh, in this case, grams is the base unit. And the K or the kilo is a modifier. It changes the size of the unit by the by the prefix. So if a gram is this big, then a kilogram is a thousand times the gram. That's what the kilo does to it. So this unit is a thousand times bigger than that unit. Okay, that's what that means. So if we if we look at look at it in those terms. <clears throat> and we look at this number as if it were 6.6 .6 times kilo times grams. Then we can say kilo is a thousand or 10 to the third grams, 6.6 .6 times. Okay, I just converted that kilo to what it actually means and kept the grams because I didn't change it. <clears throat> That would tell us grams, but it doesn't tell us milligrams. So what's a milligram? Well, a milligram, the milli is 10 to the minus three grams. <clears throat> so now if we put a prefix in here, it's gonna take a thousand times as many milligrams to go into the grams. If a milligram is a thousandth of a gram, how many milligrams does it take to make a gram? Well, if you think of a gram like this, and then this is a milligram, right? It's one thousandth of a gram, then it takes a thousand of those to make a gram. Okay, so we need a thousand more to make a milligram. So it's 6.6 .6 times 10 to the third times 10 to the third milligrams. So that makes it 6.6 .6 times 10 to the, what do we do with the exponents? Add them together, right? If the base is the same, add the exponents. So it's 10 to the sixth power. That's why the answer is B. So it'd be 6.6 .6 times 10 to the sixth milligrams. Yeah, that's, that's one way to work the problem. Like I said earlier, there's usually more than one way to work a problem. Now, let's see. Um, I want to be sure I'm not introducing a topic that we haven't covered yet. Um, measurements and calculations. Yes, we did um, conversion factors it's in chapter two, dimensional analysis. Conversion factors can also be used to work this problem. And if you've, have you watched the, the videos for each of the chapters yet? Not yet. Okay, you need to do that. Then this will make a whole lot more sense. If we take this value, 6.6 .6 kilograms, and we want to turn it into milligrams, we want to change the unit of measure. The, the rule of thumb that tells you that you're going in the right direction is 
when you get the answer over here, since the unit is getting smaller, right? We're going from kilograms to milligrams. All right, kilograms like that, milligram is like this. So the unit is getting smaller. The number will be bigger. They go opposite to one another. If this gets smaller, that part gets bigger. Okay, so here's the way we do conversion factors. Kilogram needs to be in the denominator because that's the numerator, right? So that way they'll cancel. But the conversion factor here needs to be, what's the relationship between kilograms and milligrams? Well, suppose you don't know that. Suppose you only know relationship of kilograms to grams. So this would be one kilogram would be a thousand grams, right? We mentioned that earlier. Now we've got, now we've converted it to grams, but we want to go further. We want to get rid of the grams and leave us with milligrams. So this is in the uh, numerator that has to be in the denominator to cancel the units. And this is a thousand milligrams per gram, right? So that cancels, that cancels. So now all we have to do, that's the thinking part of the problem. You analyze it, you set it up. The rest of it is number crunching. All right, so 6.6 .6 times 10 to the third times 10 to the third is 6.6 .6 times 10 to the three plus three is six kilograms. And we get the same answer. But this way we use dimensional analysis. Okay, I spent a lot of time on that problem because I sensed that it was foreign to you at this point. Okay, let's look at number two. <clears throat> Water has a density of one gram per milliliter. And what density means? Density equals mass per unit volume. And in this case, we're saying the density of water is 1.0 grams per, per milliliter. So for every milliliter of, of water, you expect it to have a mass of one gram. If you have uh, 10 milliliters of water, you would expect it to have 10 times the mass because these, these are directly related. If this increases, that has to increase. About the same amount. So the question here is, which one of these objects will float in water? Now, that's the question, but you have to know something about density and the relationship of density and uh, different substances. If this is the density of the liquid, when you put a solid in it, the ones that float are the ones that have less density than water. The ones that sink have more density than water, higher density. Okay, so that's where we need to do the calculation. Object one, two, and three. And all we have to do is determine, is their density greater than or less than one? Right? So if we do the density of the first one, um, it's grams per milliliter, right? So is that greater than one or less than one? This is bigger than that, right? So it has to be less than one. That one will float. Number one will float. Okay. How about the second one? 60.9 grams. And I'm going from this formula right here mass per unit volume and 54.7 milliliters. That's greater than one. Okay. And the third one, we don't even have to put it up here 100 grams divided by 40 is rating one. So this is the only one that will float. That's why the answer is B. <clears throat> All right, let's see E. Let's get to it. Not too much trouble. There we go. Three. 
Here we're going to convert units. But in this case, we're converting temperature of degrees Celsius to degrees Fahrenheit. In this case, we need a formula. <clears throat> we can't just use dimensional analysis because it's a combination of multiply, multiplication and addition. Okay, so you need to know the formula, and the formula is in the review document. If you look on the back page, one of the back pages, here it is. There's a useful information table at the bottom. Uh, is that it? Yeah, yours is kind of in the middle of the page. And look on the right hand side, sit under the caption says formulas. Okay. And you look down and you see the last one is T sub F equals 1.8 times T sub C plus 32. That's temperature. So the way I write it is I just write F equals uh, 9 fifths C plus 32. And that's exactly the same formula as this one. That's the temperature in Fahrenheit. That's the temperature in Celsius. This is nine divided by five is 1.8. But this is the way I memorized it decades ago. And it'll give you the same answer. So what do we know? We know this one right here. So if we plug that value in here and calculate, we'll get Fahrenheit. So all we have to do is say this, nine fifths, and then minus 12.2 degrees C plus 32. Right. So if you, um, do you remember from math class, the order of operation? Mm -hmm. Okay, if you're not given, if you're not told, well, actually the order of operation considers parentheses also. All right, parentheses first. So we're gonna do this one first. And then move along, and now we get to add the bottom or add subtract. So minus 12.2 times nine and a half, nine fifths, 12.2. And then I need to change the sign. And uh, nine times the five, five. So that's minus 21.96. This right here, minus 21.96. Um, and then plus 32. These, this is an exact number, fractions, and this is an exact number, a whole number. So you don't have to consider um, significant figures with those. You would have to consider significant figures here. And since we've got a mix, uh, multiply, divide, and add, subtract, um, you have to watch the video on the rules for significant figures. When you've got a, a mix of add, subtract, uh, multiply, divide, and add, subtract, you have to round first. So this only has three significant figures. We need minus 22.0. Uh, then we add 32 to it. Oops. This is positive and that's negative. So I, it would be better if I do it the other way. Okay. Let's do it over here. Minus 22.0. The add subtract rule says you line up the decimal points, add it together, or subtract, in this case, zero, and that's uh, one. So 10, and you have to throw this one out because that one doesn't have one. This, this dictates that you have to throw that one out. So we have 10 degrees of Fahrenheit. And notice that this answer doesn't follow the significant figures rule. So that brings up a point in a multiple choice test, when you're faced with that decision, pick the best answer. <laughs> and the best answer is 10.0 is degrees. You know what? That's right. It, I just, it just dawned on me. Because this is an exact number, it has no influence on the significant figures of your answer. So this is like a point, it just go on and on and on, All right? So that's right. I'm sorry. I made one point, but it was a false point because 
this is the correct answer, 10.0. This is the only one that limits it. All right. <coughs> We're getting off to a kind of a slow start. Let's see. 232 degrees Fahrenheit is equivalent to. So in this one, we go back, go the uh, other direction, right? If we start off with this one, um, now we're given Fahrenheit and we want to do Celsius. So you have two options. You can either plug in the number for Fahrenheit and then solve for this one, mathematically solve for the unknown, or you can solve for this one first and then plug in the value. So if we did that, that would be F minus 32, right? That one's over here. And then this one inverts. There we go. So that would be our formula for finding Celsius. So we have 232.0, um, 232.0 minus 32, right? And since 32 doesn't limit the significant figures, we have two zero zero point zero zero uh, point zero. And then this is times five ninths. And I get uh, one hundred eleven point one. Uh, degrees C. Okay. Let's see, now it's kind of chopped off my favorite scroll line. Right. Uh, some of the questions don't require calculation. Some of them just recur to require knowledge or logic. So in this one, we're, we're interested in the chemical property of gold. What is a chemical property? Well, we made a distinction between um, property versus change. With change, we're implying action. Something's moving something is 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 actually happening property references uh, a potential the potential for change so for instance if we say um, a property of something is uh, 20 degrees celsius right? that doesn't imply any kind of a change that just states a fact but if we say the temperature increases increases uh, by 10 degrees C. Now we're talking about a change. Okay. And that is a physical change. How do we know a physical versus a chemical change or a property? What we're referencing is the key word there is identity. If we're talking about a property, we're saying um, this substance has the potential to change either physically, in which the identity doesn't change at all, or chemically, where the identity does change. For example, chemical property uh, would be if we said um, uh, steel rusts. Now, when steel rusts, if it were to rust, it would become something else. It would be a different substance altogether, a change in identity. But if we just if we just say steel, steel can rust. Let's put it that way: steel can rust. Then we're talking about a property. But if we say um, uh, steel in in the presence. Uh, moisture and oxygen.
let's see, we observe. We observe that steel in the presence of moisture and oxygen uh, becomes rust. Now we're describing a chemical change. Not just the potential that it has to rust, but that we actually witnessed a change. All right, so after saying that, let's go back to which one of these is chemical property of gold? Well, gold is very dense metal. All that says that it, it has so much mass per unit volume. That's physical property. Gold is a soft metal. That's a physical property. There's no change in identity. Gold is an inert, non-reactive metal. Ah, the key there is reactive. We're describing a property of gold that says it does not react. We're not saying that we observe that it doesn't react. We're saying that this is, this is characteristic of gold, that it will not react. That's a chemical property of gold. Uh, gold is yellow, that's physical. Gold is a good conductor of heat and electricity, that's physical. The identity hasn't changed. But if gold were to react, it would become a different substance. But we're saying no. Referencing that chemical property, it doesn't react. So that's why C is the answer to number nine. Let's see here, 12. Now we get to do some significant figures here. Which rule are we dealing with? The add subtract rule. So that means when we write the numbers as given, we need to find out how many significant figures there are. 34, and then we line up the decimals, 45 and 66. We're gonna add them together. This brings up the point of, if the question is just how many significant figures are in the answer, if the operation is multiply or divide, all you need to know is which number has the least number of significant figures. And that's the limit for the answer. But with add subtract, you can't do that. You've got to actually line up the decimal points and do the operation and count the significant figures because this operation limits the, uh, the length of the number to that position. Right? If this one didn't have a four there, then it would be limited to, to that. Okay, so um, I can do this enough in my head to answer the question, but I'm gonna do the whole thing. Uh, carry the one, carry the one again, carry the one again, there we go. So now this one has four significant figures. That one has four, this one has five. Very often, too often, Students will be blasting through an exam and they'll they'll say four here, four here, there has to be four there. Okay, it doesn't work that way. Not for add subtract. And also if you have a combination uh, operation where you have an add subtract rule in there and a multiply divide rule, you have to use the PEMDAS order of, of uh, operation. And then if you have an, um, a multiply divide, that produces a term that has to be used in an add subtract rule, then you've got a round before you can do the second one. You can't wait to the end. You have to multiply divide and take that product or, or a quotient and then operate it with the add subtract rule. Um, yeah. Which of the following is an element? Uh, we define an element in terms of, um, can it be simplified? Can you make it simpler by chemical means? Can you break it apart further? And once you get to the point where no chemical action on your part can 
subdivide that substance into simpler substances, then the simpler substances that you have, that's the end of the line, those are elements. That's the definition. So, uh, alcohol. Right? Um, you can burn it. Right? Okay, so it, we can make other substances out of it, or we can make simpler substances. So that's not an element. Salt. We know that we can we can uh, break salt apart into various ions. Helium. Can't break it any simpler. Helium is an element. Yeah. And another, once you learn the periodic table, then you can bypass the definition and say, is it up there? Okay. And there it is, right there. Yeah. It's an element. Sugar is a compound, vinegar is a compound of several elements. Let's see. It's another unit conversion problem. How many liters are in a 29 ounce bottle of pop? So we're starting with 29 ounces. <clears throat> but we want to say, what's the question? The question is how many liters? That's the end. That's the end game. We want to know how many liters. And liters is always capital L. Uh, and we're given conversion factors here. These are equivalents. And all conversion factors are derived from equivalents. I discussed that in, in the uh, uh, lecture chapter. Okay. So that'll give you a more complete description. But in order to use that equivalence as a conversion factor, we have to turn it into a fraction. So we put 32 fluid ounces on top of quarts, or we put one quart on top of 32 ounces as a divisor, and that will give us our conversion factor. But it won't get us all the way to the end. Ounces on the bottom, quarts on the top. So we have one quart, and this is 32 ounces. So the ounces are done, there's a quart. So how many liters in a quart? That means liters on top, because that's in the numerator. Quarts on the bottom, because that's in the numerator. And the relationship is one liter equals 1.0567 quarts. Okay? So we know that we've got the right units because the rest of them canceled. We're left with that in the numerator. So that's the thinking part. Now all we have to do is say 29 divided by 32, also divided by 1.0567. And when you get conversion factors involved in a calculation, the significant figures are only dependent upon the first number. These are exact numbers, exact numbers. They have no bearing on the final, on the output of uh, significant figures. So this has two significant figures, and rather than do the calculation at the same time, the answer should be 0 0.86. 0 0.86 figures. And that's two significant figures because that zero doesn't count. By the way, <clears throat> if you've developed the habit over the years of writing numbers like this as 0.86, don't do it in this class. That's wrong. No decimal point to the left can be left dangling. That's an orphan decimal, I call it. It has to be bracketed by this zero. And that's okay on this side because that zero is not significant by the definitions, by the rules of significant figures. So I'll always bracket those right there. All right, that was 18. Oh. Which of the following is a homogeneous mixture? Uh, a mixture is a physical combination of elements or compounds um, that retain their individual identities. And we can tell that they do because they can be separated by physical means. So if we make um, sugar water for the bird feeder, for the hummingbird feeder. And we want to 
we want to get the sugar back, all we have to do is, is take the water and set it on the, the countertop and just let the water evaporate. And we got sugar left. So we know that the identity of sugar did not change in the process. That's a mixture. There's a difference between mixtures as to uh, how uniform they are. If the mixture is uniform throughout, in other words, uh, for instance, our example, sugar water. If it's got the same amount of sugar uh, by percentage everywhere we sample it, then it's homogeneous. It's the same throughout. If there are different amounts of what we put in there, the mixtures, if they vary like a jar of jelly beans, right? You look on one side and so a whole bunch of greens and blacks. But on the other side, there's more reds and yellows. That's my side. Then we know that it's not uniform throughout. That's heterogeneous. But the homogeneous ones here, we want to look for, first of all, uh, now that I've said that, analyze the question, which of the following is a homogeneous mixture? Well, out of that list, which one is a mixture? Right? If it's not a mixture, then you throw it out. Uh, gasoline's a mixture. Copper metal is an element. Throw it out. Jelly beans, mixture. Pure water. Throw it out. It's not a mixture. It's pure. Soil is, is also a mixture, yes. Okay, so we can look at gasoline, jelly beans, and soil to see which one is homogeneous. We just talked about jelly beans. They're never homogeneous. And take it from me, soil is not homogeneous either. It's heterogeneous. That's my, my PhD is in soil science. So the only one left is gasoline. It is a homogeneous mixture. And we have another name for homogeneous mixtures. And they're called a solution. Homogeneous mixture is synonymous with solution. All right. Uh, 22. A graduated cylinder contains 20 milliliters of water. 20.0 milliliters. Sometimes it helps to draw a picture. Uh, this graduated cylinder has, uh, let's say, 20 milliliters of water. All right. Um, an irregularly shaped object is placed in the cylinder and the water level rises to 31.2 milliliters. So when we put the object in the bottom of it, the volume rises. Now it's 31.2 milliliters. Okay. Why did it rise? Because we displaced some of the water with that object. Right? So what does that tell you about the object? It tells you that the difference in these volumes is the volume of the object. That's determining volume by difference. When you submerge an object in a liquid and you measure the difference in the liquid volume, you are actually measuring that with that difference, the volume of the object. We are also given that the object has a mass of 80.4 grams. So the volume of the object is 31.2 milliliters or 11.2 milliliters is the volume. That's volume. This is mass. And the question is, what's the density? So you need to know the formula. Uh, I'm not sure if I put the formula in here. Density is such a simple formula. You ought to be able to memorize that. Oh, it's in there. Density equals mass divided by volume. Right. So we just put uh, 80.4 grams divided by 11.2 milliliters. And that should equal 7.18 grams per milliliter. And in this case, each of these values, that one and that one, each one has three significant figures. So the answer can have three based upon the multiply divide rule 
You just look at the one that has the least. They're both the same, so the answer can have three. And all right. So the next one, 25, is going to be a multi-step, it looks like. <clears throat> what Kelvin temperature reading equals 61.2 degrees Fahrenheit? And we're looking for Kelvin. Kelvin is another system of measuring temperature. We did not discuss that in the lecture on that chapter. Um, the nice thing about Kelvin is zero degrees Kelvin is the bottom of the scale. There's nothing below it. So Kelvin has no negative numbers. They're always positive. We call it absolute zero. But when you're measuring temperature, you're measuring a physical phenomenon and um, you get different numbers depending on the scales that you're using, right? The physical phenomenon doesn't change. It's got the same amount of energy in that object that's responsible for the temperature, no matter what the scale you use. So they should be interconvertible, and they are. Um, in order to get Kelvin, though, we need to know Celsius because Kelvin equals Celsius plus 273. So we got to find Celsius out of this one. Right. So that's what's going to be nine fifths C plus 32. <clears throat> I guess I need to calculate this one. So I'm going to solve for C. That means this one has to be subtracted minus 32. 61.2 plus 32 minus is 29.2. Since that's an exact number, and 29.2 uh, is, I can keep all those significant figures, and then I need to multiply it by five and divide it by nine, because now I'm over here, and I need to get that fraction over here. When it crosses the equals, it flips. Remember? Okay. So five ninths times that, five times nine divided, is 16.2. 16.2. Um, and this is degree C. So now that we have that value, 16.2 plus 273. And that's an exact number too. So we can keep all these decimal places. And I got 289, 289.2. K. The interesting thing about K is we never use that degree mark. It's just K. Only with degrees Fahrenheit, degrees Celsius, uh, do we use that little degree mark. K is always just K. So, all right, the best answer is C. Now, why, why did my answer come out of this one and not 289.4? Because they probably used more decimal places in their conversion factor. And I always just use three if it's good enough for us. But if you if you add that together, you should come out with uh, 289.4. And like I said again, <clears throat> in a multiple choice has a big bad answer. In this course, um, especially if you take the exam in face to face. Uh, I will grade the exam before you leave the room. And you can look at it and say, well, I thought this answer was right. And if you can, if you can prove your logic with me and your procedure, show me your, your work, then you may get credit for it. It's, it's possible. It's not as likely now than it was when I first started teaching. But uh, uh, these Documents have been vetted over and over again, and we found mistakes here and there, but you could find another one. If you find a mistake somewhere, then, you know, my, my rule is student doesn't suffer from my mistakes. Okay, so if it's unrecoverable error, then I just give you credit for the, for the answer. 
whether you got it right or not. Because the question, sometimes the question is just bad. Okay, 26. <clears throat> Which of the following processes is a chemical change? Now we're actually describing a change in identity of substances. So dry ice sublimes when left on the, the tabletop. It's just been going from solid to gas. The light on a candle burns until a bell jar is placed over it for a period of time. That's a chemical change. Yeah. You're taking the wax. The process is the wax gets melted from the heat from the candle and it's wicked up into the, the wick. And uh, heat further converts it into a gas. At that point, it's able to mix with the air around it. So it draws in air, mixes with the gas, and the heat uh, triggers a, a combustion of the wax in the gas state with oxygen, and you get a change in identity. So there you go. Now, um, normally, when you find the right answer, you can stop. But if you look down here, notice that none of the above processes are chemical changes. So you look for these squirrely ones at the bottom. None of the above, all of the above, two of the above, that kind of thing, right? Uh, multiple choice questions are notorious for those. But if, uh, in this case, we say none of the above processes are chemical, we found one. So E's wrong. And B is the answer. Right? Because it doesn't say two of the above. You, just, you find the right answer and you're done. So hopefully that will speed you through an exam if you can make those decisions. <clears throat> Oops, I'm going to have to scroll back. One thing about this remote that I bought, it does not scroll. It's got a nice mouse on it. I can move the mouse around. I can point to stuff like that. So highlight that. That kind of thing. But the only way you can scroll it is to move the mouse over to the right and find the scroll bar. And in this case, it's off the right edge of the screen. I can't get to it. Not easily. Be kind of guesswork. Okay. Which metric met prefix, metric prefix is used to designate one tenth, one tenth, or one tenth, or one tenth? Any one of those. Which prefix designates one tenth? Okay. Well, the M means mega. That means whatever the base unit is, you multiply it by 10 to the sixth. Okay. That's not it. Kilo, we did earlier. That's times 10 to the third, right? How about C? Centi is one hundredth, or 10 is times 10 to the minus two. That's not it. We did milli earlier. That's 10 to the minus three. So it would be the last one. That's 10 to the minus one. That's one tenth of whatever the base unit is. All right, let's see. Okay, there must have been some repetition. We skipped all the way down to 36. The volume in milliliters occupied by 41.9 gram of mercury. So we're given 41.9 grams of mercury. That's the symbol for mercury. Um, <clears throat> when a problem has um, lots of numbers and uh, quantitative information like that in it, I like to extract the information and put it on the board separate from the wording, separate from the prose. Because very often word problems are designed to confuse. And the reason they're designed to confuse is that so only people who, of the student that understands uh, the, the principles and the processes that are involved in solution, only that student can extract the information they need and solve the problem. The others see a lot of blue smoke. It's like uh, uh, a hawk trying to catch a bird in a flock, right? He gets confused with all the birds. 
that happens in these problems. They're, they're designed to throw stuff at you that's not needed. Um, fortunately, in this one, most of that stuff is needed, but I still extract it, put it on the board. We're given this, that many grams of mercury. We're also given the density of mercury. It's equal to 13.6 grams per millimeter. Then the question, volume in milliliters. That's what's, what we need to know. Answer that question. Okay, so if we're talking density, volume, and mass, we're eventually going to need this formula, mass divided by volume. <clears throat> and since the volume is the question, We'll solve our equation for volume, right? Yeah. So now, um, as long as the units are right, okay, we want in milliliters. Okay? Density is in milliliters divided into grams. We got grams here. We're going to get milliliters there. I think we're safe with the units of measure. They're all compatible. So if we solve the equation like that, then volume equals, what's the mass? 41.9 grams. And the density is 13.6 grams per milliliter. Okay? This is a, a, a rule from math. The, if you have a fraction inside of fraction, in this case, it's in the denominator. The denominator of the denominator is the numerator. So that means this gram per milliliter flips. And that one stays in the denominator and cancels this gram right here. But that milliliter comes on top. And now that's our numerator units of measure. Okay. So 41.9 divided by 13.6 should be. 3.08. Three significant figures. This is a divide rule. Three significant figures. Well, this doesn't matter because it's a conversion factor, but this one has three, so that one can have three. I know the computer and camera get in your way. I got one student that, uh, in the class. In fact, I think they. Yeah, we meet today. Um, she has um, a, a hearing problem. It's um, one of the bones in her middle ear is ossifying, they say. I don't know what exactly that means, but it's reducing her ability to hear. So I say, okay, um, you can sit close up here, right? Or you can grab one of those rolling chairs and just roll it up here, right? <laughs> Get closer. Uh, there are certain frequencies that are, are more difficult to hear than others, too. And as it turns out, um, my speaking voice is in that range. That's difficult for her to hear. Um, okay, so we did that one. 40. Uh, I'm going to have to scroll that. And we can get two of them at once. Number 40. Let's see how am I doing on time. It's after 10, and we're supposed to go till 11. All right, so I'm going to run out of time. What I'll have to do is, is just keep recording the review. If you have to go at 11, and, and it'll be recorded, and I'll post it in Brightspace. Okay, so 40. <laughs> How many significant figures are in this number? Zero, zero, four. Zero, zero, nine, zero. Yeah. Remember the rules. These leading zeros are never significant. Um, captive zeros here between two non-zero numbers. Well, all non-zero numbers are significant. And these zeros between those two are captive. They're significant also. And then far right, this one is significant. Only because there is an explicit decimal in the number. So that means we have one, two, three, four, five significant figures. Okay. 
Now, I also go through the, uh, the introductory material in the lecture videos. You'll see if we take, uh, let's take this number out and throw away those decimals. Let's just write this, 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 and that. If we write the number exactly like that with no explicit decimal point, then that zero becomes not significant. If we mean it to be significant, then we'll put a decimal there. Now it's significant. Forty-one. Oh, another prefix. Um, ten to the minus two. We did that one earlier when we ran through that list. Ten to the minus two is centi. And that's the prefix is that little c. Uh, we did all the rest of them too, so we don't have to hash all. We don't have to worry about those. We just move on. Uh, it would be a scroll. All right. So this one is an operation that has a combination of rules add subtract multiply divide so i better write the whole thing out 0 0.4333 3, 3. j per g degree c that's joules per gram degree celsius we haven't talked about joules yet 33.12 Degree C minus 31.12 degree C. And then I just squirrel it down here. 412.1 grams. Actually, this is the calculation for a, a calorimetry experiment. Maybe we'll get a look at those later. But right now what we're dealing with is um order of operation so we've got this in a parentheses got that in parentheses got this in a parentheses so we have to do that one first before we can multiply the rest of it based on our uh, rules of operation order of operation so 33.12 minus 31.12 gives us what well, that's zero zero I line up the decimal, we can keep those two, and this is two. So that's plus two times the rest of it. So we don't have to finish the calculation because this is the one where we had to do the operation as a track. But the rest of them, now that we've got this one, multiply that one times that one times that one. The multiply rule says the least number of significant figures in the operation determine the outcome. So this one has three, this one has four, this one has four. So our answer can only have three significant figures in it. And that saves you time. You don't have to do the whole operation to answer the question. Excuse me. Which example of a homogeneous mixture? I thought we had one of those before. Well, which ones are mixture? Soil? Soil dust. Okay. That's a mixture. Sodium chloride. No, that's a pure substance. It's a compound, but it's a pure substance. Aluminum. That's an element. It's a pure substance. Vodka. That's a mixture. Oily water. That's a mixture. Okay. So homogeneous means that you have to have uh, uniform throughout. Soil is not uniform throughout. Or the water is not uniform throughout. So the only one can be vodka. So primarily uh, water and ethanol with some other things in it. But 48 is D. Let's see. It's like we got a lot of redundancy in there, so we're skipping way down to 68. A cubic centimeter 
And then, why did you do that? I must have accidentally A cubic centimeter is equivalent to what other metric volume unit? I'll make a point of this in the lecture video. A cubic centimeter, one cubic centimeter is equal to one millimeter. They're identical. And if you if you go into a hospital storeroom or a doctor's storeroom and find um, syringes or any other object that's calibrated has markings on it for volume, and they're old, the old ones will say so many cc's. Right? That's cubic centimeters. It was easier in the early days to print on things, cc's rather than cm to the third power. That's just, it's hard on the, uh, the lithographers to do that. So they said cc instead. But uh, along comes millimeters. You know, when that was finally standardized and they realized that's equal to this, then for international compatibility and the fact that we're buying most of our stuff from China, um, so now they convert it to milliliters. Well, it didn't change the uh, dose amounts. It didn't change anything because they're exactly the same size unit. So that was fortunate. All right, 71. The state of matter for an object Uh, that has a definite volume, but not a definite shape. So the volume is definite. But an indefinite shape. What state of matter does that describe? Which forms of matter have a definite volume? Solids. And liquids. But a solid has a definite shape and the liquid doesn't. So this is a liquid. It needs a container, right? It can't hold its own shape, but it does hold its own volume uh, under room temperature and pressure for scenario. Right? If you take a liquid and put extreme pressure on it, like at the bottom of the ocean, about two miles down. Uh, they find that water down there is much denser than it is on the surface. So liquids do respond to pressure and change the volume, but it's not very much. And for general purposes, this is a liquid. And we abbreviate it liquid in parentheses. <coughs> mm. Let's see, 84, I need to scroll out so we can see the beaker on the right. There it is. Okay. <clears throat> um, you take 20 milliliters of water from a graduated cylinder. 20.0 milliliters of water from graduated cylinder and you add it to this beaker, what's the new volume of water in the beaker? Well, we have to read the volume off of this device, off of this beaker. Notice that there are markings for every 10 milliliters, but there are no markings for in-between, so we got to guess about the in-between. And that, that is referenced in the uh, lecture videos in terms of um, certain and uncertain digits in a number. The certain digits are everything but the last one. So when a scientist sees a number, this is immediately what he or she is going to see. Those are certain. This one is uncertain. Um, The uncertain dis digit is an educated guess. And from 
from a practical standpoint, the educated, the guess is when you don't have markings on your device, then you guess in between. And that's what we're doing with this one. So what do we say about the, the volume of the beaker? Well, we know it's between 10 and 20. So it's gonna be 10, the 10's place, and then about halfway between 20, uh, 10 and 20. So we're guessing it's 15 milliliters, right? That's two significant figures. That's as far as we go. We can't estimate any further. So if we add them together, 20.0, 0, 0, 5, 3, but we can only keep up to that point. So our answer should be 35 milliliters. That's the point of this question, right? It's not 35.0 because this one is only two significant figures up to the decimal point, but not beyond. So we can't keep that one, it has to be this one. Okay. <coughs> Good, I need to scroll up and get a drink of water at the same time. All right, which of the following is only a physical change? Leaves turn colors in the fall. Well, the color change describes a physical phenomenon. Right? That is a change. But why do the leaves turn colors? Because there's a chemical change going on inside the leaf. So that's a combination effect. Right, can't be A. A banana ripens. <laughs> That's a biochemical reaction right, inside the banana. Cookies burn in the oven. Okay. Well, they do get harder, right? But there is a, a chemical change that takes place. You see it in the browning of, of the material. Sugar dissolves in coffee. Right? We still got sugar, we still got coffee. They haven't changed their identity. That's a physical change only. That's why we put that word right there, only a physical change, because these do have physical changes involved, but they're also chemical changes too. So the only one that has uh, physical change only is sugar. And the last one, at least two of the above exhibit only physical change. Well, no. We've, we've come to the conclusion that only one of them does. So he can't be right either. <coughs> All right, 107. This references definitions. A blank is a summary of observed behavior. And a blank is an explanation of the behavior. This is where we discussed in, in the uh, lecture part of the course, the difference between laws and theory. The law just says what happens, makes no attempt to explain why. Theory though, does propose a reason for things happening, the why fors. So uh, if blank is a summary of observed observations, that's the law. And an explanation for that behavior is the theory. So it'd be law and theory, which is B. Okay. Let's see here. <laughs> One fourteen. Your friend is five foot, 9.8 inches tall. Five foot, 9.8 inches tall. What's your friend's height in meters? Okay. Notice we've got two different units expressing a person's height. So in order to make the conversion, this has to be placed in a common single unit somehow. Uh, inches is a good way to go. Right? 
and we just say 12 times that, we get uh, 60, right? 60 uh, inches plus 9.8 inches. So 9.8 inches now, now we can convert that to uh, meters. So what conversion factors do we know? Well, let's see what are available in the review document because any um, useful information that's in the review document at the back will also be duplicated in the exam. Paper exam will have this useful information on a detachable page at the back. Uh, if you take the exam in Brightspace and using Lockdown Browser, then in the module, in the part of the module where you uh, access the exam, there's also down below it, you'll see a thing called useful information. So before you go into the exam, in which case Lockdown Browser will shut you out of everything, make a copy of that useful information and have it with you. That's kosher. Then when you go in, you'll have that information available. Okay, so I was looking for conversion factors. Do we have a conversion factor in here? Conversion factors on the left of that table, let's see, inches, inches. One foot, we already did that, one foot inch. It looks like the only one we have useful is one inch equals 2.54 centimeters. That gets rid of inches and gets us into the metric system. Here we're in imperial units or English units. Now we're in the metric system and we can use decimal conversions. So we know what a centimeter is. How many centimeters in a meter? Well, centi is one hundredth of a meter. So that means a hundred of them it takes to make one meter. There we go. So that's the thinking part. Now we just have to crunch the numbers. And um, this dictates that we only we can have three significant figures in our answer because that's a multiply rule. And uh, it should be, actually it should be better than 1.8 meters. Did I do that right? 12 times that. Oh, no, my fault. Because this times 12 is two significant figures. It can only be 60 there. So 9.8 plus that. And this has to be, um, since we're adding it, this has to be rounded to 70. So 70 times that divided by 10 should be 1.8 meters. And so, see, I made a mistake here. I brought that down. Um, Yeah, this is times. So that times that, two significant figures, because this one doesn't count. Two significant figures. Now, now I can add 9.8. That brings it down here, plus I have to round to, to that decimal place right there. Okay. 16. It's not great. We are getting some redundancy in here, aren't we? Which of the following is an incorrect description? I must really want you to know what mixtures are. Uh, a homogeneous mixture, is that possible? Yeah, yeah, that's possible. A solid element, yeah. In fact, most of the metals are solid. Solid element, that's compatible. A solution of gases, oh yeah. You can have solutions of any phases. In fact, when you put two or more gases together, they always form a solution, a homogeneous mixture, every time, no exceptions. A mixture of solids. Yeah, that's possible. A heterogeneous compound. <laughs> no, compound is a pure substance. It's a combination of elements uh, that is fixed in its composition. You'll have the same, no matter where the, this is the law of definite proportions. 
no matter where the compound comes from, originates, whether it's, say, water that you purify from the ocean or water that you get from a reaction of hydrogen and oxygen, the end product is the same no matter where it, what its source. And the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen in this case is exactly the same by mass every time. That's a compound. Okay, so the answer is E. Uh, let's see. Okay, 119 references that device on the right, that picture on the right. So using zero as your reference point, how much liquid has left the burette? That device is called a burette, and it's going to be difficult to see because but it's long, it goes the whole page. So let me describe what a burette is. It's a device for dispensing liquid and determining the exact volume that has been dispensed. That's why instead graduated cylinders are numbered in volume from bottom to top because they're designed to contain a volume. This one is designed to deliver a volume. So it's zero starts at the top. So if you, if you fill it up to the zero mark and then open that stopcock at the bottom and let some of it out and close it and then read the new volume, that tells you how much volume you, you dispensed. And in this case, we're saying, okay, if we start at zero, now we've ended up where? Well, the amount dispensed is between 20 and 30, right? And then how about the markings? How many markings between 20 and 30? Well, they're 10, right? There's a half mark in there, but total of 10. So that means each one of those marks is one milliliter, 20 to 30. So where does it stop? It looks like it's on 22, doesn't it? You have to read burettes the other direction. 22. And there is a marking for the 22. So that means we can guess the last one. These are um, God, my mind's going blank. We just talked about it a minute ago. We have to guess the last one. Okay, so twenty two point zero. Uh, why can't I think of that? Not exact. Certain. These are certain numbers because there are markings on the device for those numbers, 20 and the 2. So the last one is the one that we guess right there. So that's why the answer is D and not E. We don't just stop with the marked value. If you do, uh, any scientist that reads that is going to say, okay, the tens position, the two in the tens position is certain, and the two in the ones position is uncertain. Right? But we don't want that. We want these both to be certain, so that means we have to add that point zero on the end. All right, 124, 20 minutes. Aluminum has a density of 2.70 grams per cubic centimeter. The density of aluminum, 2.70 grams per cubic centimeter. Notice that when we were talking about mercury earlier, the density was grams per milliliter. That's convention for liquids. It's grams per milliliter. For solids, we say grams per cubic centimeter. But the number's the same. What is the mass of a regular block of aluminum measuring 11.1 centimeters? Let's say we have a block here of aluminum. 11 centimeters. Say it's 11.1 .1 centimeters here. It's 22 centimeters. Um, let's say 22 centimeters in height, 0.2 centimeters, and 34.5 centimeters wide. OK, 
Okay. What's the mass? So if this density equals mass per unit volume. We know the D value. Um, we don't know the mass value, and we can calculate the volume, right? That one times that one times that one. So let's do that real quick. 11.1 times 22.2 times 34.5 is um, 8501.49 cubic centimeters. Three significant figures here, here, and here. So we have to round this one off to 8, 5, 0. Let's do it in scientific notation. So scientific notation will be 8.501 or 9 times 10, 1, 2, 3 to the third power. Now we can round the three significant figures. Oh, you know, we don't have to do that. You know why? Because all of our operations are multiplied by so we can keep all of our decimal places to the very end and then round. Okay, so we've got this one in the denominator, multiply these three together in the denominator, and the numerator is, well, the answer. So this value is going to be multiplied by that value to get this one. So that one times 2.70, grams per cubic centimeter, and this is cubic centimeters, multiply those together, 2.70 is 2.2954 times 10 to the fourth um, gram, uh, grams. What I like to do is when I've got a, a series of operations that are all multiply divide, then um, when I, I put the operations into my calculator, I keep all of the decimal points until the very end because the ones that you can keep are defined by the one that has the least number. And all of these have three significant figures, so we can round it to 2.30 times 10 to the fourth grams. Grams is not up there, is it? Uh, it's kilograms. Okay. So let's convert it. How many grams in a kilogram? Cancel the grams, leave some kilograms. 10 to the third. Okay. So we cancel the grams. 10 to the third in the denominator subtracts three of those. So we got 2.30 times 10 to the first kilograms or 23.0 kilograms. Hey. An illusion anywhere? <laughs> Takes practice. That's why my review documents have. Lots of questions and problems in them. The more practice you get, the easier it'll get. Um, in fact, I, I tell my students that your two best friends in this class are curiosity. You always want to know more and know why things work, and boredom. If you're bored working these problems, that means you've probably worked enough of them. <laughs> Let's see. I've got a series here, 132. Convert Celsius to Fahrenheit. We don't need to do that. You just use the formula. F equals 9 fifths C plus 32. And don't forget the sign. That's a negative. Okay. So we're going to skip that one. How about 133? No chemical change is involved in one of these. Baking a cake. 
Oh yeah, we put baking soda in there and it, it generates gas, makes the cake rise. Boiling water, no chemical change there. Why? Because the identity of the water didn't change. It just changed from liquid water to gaseous water. That's a physical change. And since there are no other squirrely ones down here, we can stop. That's our answer. Let's see, I'm gonna have to scroll up to rule 34. Comprehensive density of 8.96 grams per cubic centimeter. Density of copper, 8.96 grams per cubic centimeter. Will that sink or float in water? It'll drop to the bottom because <laughs> water is only one gram per cubic centimeter. More dense, it'll drop. Now, if you, if you put it in mercury, if you set it on top of mercury, Mercury's like, what, 13.5? Yeah, it'll float. Uh, if a cylinder of copper weighing 34.94 is dropped into a the mass is 34.94 grams, is dropped into a graduated cylinder containing 20 milliliters of water, so the initial volume is 20 milliliters. What's the final volume? The new level of water is what? Well, the difference in the volume is the volume contributed by the copper. So when we drop the copper in there, it's going to go from 20 to something. So the difference here, the final volume minus the initial volume, delta V, that's equal to uh, M over V, that's equal to, um, excuse me, M divided by D. We just rearrange this. So we're looking for the volume is equal to M over D. So if we put it that way, then we can plug in, we don't know the final volume. We do know the initial volume. Um, we know, let's see, we know the mass, 34.94 grams, and we know the density, 8.96 grams per cubic centimeter. Okay. So we can solve it. Just divide that one into that one, and then take this one over here and add it to that, that quotient, and that gives you the final volume. And if you do that, you should get 23.9 milliliters. The final volume is 23.9. What that says is that the change in volume or the volume of the copper was 3.9. Yeah, 3.9 milliliters. Difference in these two. If I went too fast, it's worked out in the handwritten problem there. I'll try to finish before I run out of time. 137, this one should go pretty quick. How many significant figures are in this number? 4.00, .00 Seven zero zero times ten to the thirteen. Do we need need to even look at that? No, power of ten doesn't matter. Significant figures are that information is contained in the coefficient. These zeros are captive; they're significant. These zeros are uh, to the right with a decimal, so they're significant. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six significant figures in that number. One thirty-eight. Which of the following is not a step in the scientific method? Now, we haven't talked about this at all up to this point today, but we do talk about it in depth in a previous video. Not a step in the scientific method. Okay, 
Well, the scientific method usually starts with an observation. Right? And then you wonder, you wonder, you want to figure out what's going on here. So you devise a hypothesis. You say, this is what I think is happening with that observation. The hypothesis needs to be worded in such a way that you can test it. And then you experiment. And then I think this is left out of the, the discussion, but then you can evaluate. In other words, you say, based on the results of that experiment, does it support my hypothesis or does it refute my hypothesis? And then you go back and uh, job security, keep doing it over and over again. It slight changes, of course. Or you go either make another observation, you could go here, change your hypothesis, or you could make another observation. And you just do that until you get your answer. So which one of these is, uh, a, is not a step in this method? Change results to agree with your hypothesis. <laughs> yeah, that's known as unethical behavior. <laughs> Unfortunately, not a few uh, research scientists have met the end of their career by doing that. Because uh, the publication and peer review process is designed to, to out those type of people with weak morals. <clears throat> well, I should say weak ethics. And they would, uh, they get canned and can't come back. Let's see, I better scroll that one. Get close, 24 or 29 pages. Let's see. That was B, but I want to get all three of them together. 148. An example of a mixture is gold is an element, not a mixture. The air in this room, yeah, that's a mixture. Purified water. Nope, that's just a compound. Hydrogen fluoride, that's a compound. So all of those are not mixtures. The only mixture there, I mean, there is air in this room. It's a homogeneous mixture or a solution. 49. How many of the following are compounds? All right. Um, definition of a compound. A compound has to have uh, two or more elements bound together so that they behave as a unit. Another way of saying that is a unique substance. <clears throat> so, which ones do that? Well, let's see. Let's look at all of them and say, does each one have two or more different elements? Yep, they do. Right. Um, and are they bound together to form a single unit? Water, dinitrogen tetroxide, sodium hydroxide, manganese oxide, manganese four oxide. We'll talk about that later, naming compounds. And hydrogen fluoride. Yeah, they're all compounds. Every one of them. Right. Um, confusion sets in sometimes with students when you look at this. That's not a compound. That's two hydrogen atoms bound together as a single unit. That's a diatomic element. And you probably have noticed in that uh, periodic table, I've got several of them that have blue backgrounds on them. Those are all diatomics. So at normal temperatures and one atmosphere pressure, they will be two atoms hooked together. Hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, fluorine, fluorine, bromine, iodine. Those are all diatomics. And the reason I, I hammer that point is because 
word problems sometimes name the compounds, but they don't tell you what the formula is. So you've got to you've got to be able compounds and elements. You got to be able to recognize uh, when and how to write them correctly, so that when you put them into a chemical reaction, that you can balance it correctly. That that'll come later. But and we say oxygen reacts with hydrogen to to produce water. Right? If you try to write that equation and you put O by itself and H by itself uh, yields H2O, it'll never balance because hydrogen and oxygen are written wrong. They're O2 and H2. Uh, let's see. Oh, 150. How many of the following are pure compounds? Okay, let's see. Pure compounds. Let's see. Which ones are compounds? Well, iron's not a compound. Oxygen is not a compound. Sodium is an element. So uh, sugar and air are our choices. Air is a mixture of elements. So sugar is the only, by process of elimination, is the only compound in there. And we don't have a zero here, so we can't say none of them. We have to say which one is best, and that's one. Let's see. Let's do the first one. 154. Helium is an example of what? Not a compound. It's not a mixture. It's an element. That's the only one it could be. Helium is an element. Okay, 156. Which of the following is an element? Okay, so we got to. I do have some redundancy in here, don't I? Which of the following is an element? Water's a compound. Earth is a mixture. A big mixture. <laughs> Salt is a compound of sodium and chlorine. Brass is a mixture of copper and nickel. Oxygen is an element. Can't be broken down any further. Whereas each of those others can be reduced to simpler substances. So E, oxygen is the answer to that. 161, scroll again. Here we go. What's the result of the following multiplication expressed in scientific notation to the correct number of significant figures? All right, so when you have, this is a multiply divide rule. Times 10 to the third. And then multiply that times 8.0 times 10 to the minus 3. Um, you're going to be, this is a multiply divide rule, so you're going to be limited to the least number. This is 2. So you can only have two significant figures. And that will be expressed in the uh, coefficient. Right. So we could look at this and say, there are two significant figures. There's two. So it's either this one or this one, one or the other. I mean, you can go, in fact, we could go and, and punch those numbers in our calculator, right, and get a value and then round it off to two significant figures and answer the question. But um, say my finger's tired and I don't want to use my calculator. So I would say this number is actually this one times that one, and then this one times that one, right? Because this is this times that times that times that. So 10 to the third uh, uh, times uh, 10 to the minus three is one, right? They're gone. Three plus minus three is, is zero. So that's one. And eight times five is 40. But eight times 0.46 is, is about half of that, which is four. So it'd be 44 um, or 4.4 times 10 to the first power. 
let's see. And your calculator should give you the same answer. But I, I did it. Um, I like to do that occasionally, keep my, my synapses working. Or as I said, if you don't use it, you lose it. Yeah. When I retired from the federal government, I was in research for 22 years, 23 years with the federal government. And when I retired, I sort of was forced into early retirement. That's another story. <clears throat> but I did some things around the house and found myself sitting a lot, doing nothing. And I could just feel my brain just melting away. I said, I got to do something or I'm going to be senile in another year. So uh, I brushed off my resume and uh, I found uh, New River. It was over on uh, Die Drive off of uh, Harper Park. So I went over there and walked into one of the offices and asked them, you know, who do I talk to about uh, teaching? And she said, I'll, I'll take it and I'll get it to the right person. Two days later, Dean called me, said, can you teach this course for us? Adjunct. Just a one semester contract says, sure, I'd love to. They didn't have any chemistry available or physics or any physical science. They said, what we've got is this introductory um, anatomy and physiology class. What, what we uh, number is 105, 106 series. 105, 106 is the lab. That's our introductory a &P course. I said, sure, I'll teach it. I've got a bachelor's degree in biology. I should be able to teach it. So I did. And I did that for several years until um, they needed a, um, somebody to teach chemistry at this location, on, still at that campus. Uh, and we had a chemistry instructor at Greenbrier who was taking care of that neck of the woods. So I, I taught introductory chemistry over there, this class over there for several semesters. And then we moved over here. And when we did, Dr. Washington, who was president then, asked me if, if I wanted to uh, come on full time uh, as a, uh, what they call it, uh, not temporary instructor, visiting, visiting instructor. I said, sure. So I came on and I knew that after three years, uh, they, couldn't, they couldn't renew my contract past three years. So they decided to convert to a, a permanent position with promotion possibilities. But the catch was I had to interview for it. So I did, and that's why I'm still here. <laughs> but <clears throat> I don't even know why I started that conversation. Uh, we did that one already. That was my brain. I had to fix my brain. And the, the challenges of teaching have kept my brain from going soft. 169. We should be getting close to the end. Oops. Of course, I have it. Okay, we're past 11. So if you need to go, you can go. Uh, if you've got time, then I should be finished in just a short time. Uh, a blank change involves a change in the fundamental components of the substance. A given substance's change, substance changes into a different substance. What type of change is that? There's a lot of blue smoke in there, things that really don't bear on the question. Kinetic doesn't matter, mix doesn't matter, potential doesn't matter. It's a battle between chemical versus physical. Right? If the identity of the substance changes, you're talking chemical. So that's why the answer is E. Let's see. Oh, that's it. We're done.